Coming up on iOS today, I am excited to say that despite the fact that Rosemary Orchard is not here, we will be joined by Shelly Brisbane to talk all things iOS accessibility. Stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is iOS Today, episode 615, recorded Tuesday, August 16th, 2022. iOS Accessibility with Shelley Brisbane. This episode of iOS Today is brought to you by Blueland. Blueland is on a mission to eliminate single-use plastics by reinventing home essentials that are good for you and good for the planet. Right now, you can get 15% off your first order when you go to blueland.com slash iOS. Welcome back to iOS Today, the show where we talk all things iOS, tvOS, watchOS, HomePod OS, iPad OS. Oh, it's all the OSs that Apple has on offer. We love to talk about them here on iOS Today. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent, and I am not joined today by Rosemary Orchard. But don't worry, because I have a great guest for you today. It is the one and only Shelly Brisbane. Welcome to the show, Shelly. Hi, Micah. Thanks so much for having me. I'll try to live up to being Rosemary. I, I don't think I can, though. That's a lot to ask. Look, <laughs> look, it is Rosemary's world and we're all just living in it. But uh, right? if if there could be anybody who could join us today, I am so excited to get you on because I have wanted to uh, bring you on the show quite a, for quite a while now. You do a podcast over on the Relay FM network called Parallel. And I was hoping you could start by telling us a little bit about what Parallel is, what it has to offer, uh, so that folks go and check out that show. Sure thing. Well, Parallel, like most of the podcasts on the Relay Network, is about technology, but I always say it has accessibility sprinkles. And what that means is we talk about a general tech topic, but we also put accessibility context on it. And that might be iOS, like what we're talking about today, or it might be AR and VR, or it might be uh, something new from Google. So anything tech related, we find a way to spin some accessibility into it. And hopefully that's interesting both to an audience that cares about accessibility as a number one, but also to an audience of, of just general interest tech folks who want to know a little bit more about accessibility. Yeah, because I think one of the things about accessibility that's so amazing is if if you pay close enough attention to it, I think that it is a bit of an empathy opener, if if that makes sense. It is this, it is an opportunity to uh sort of unlock more empathy with inside yourself and realize how all of these tools can be used for everybody and that you know everybody's life is improved whenever we have uh these considerations made and i think that that's one of the the best parts about this you know a lot of times these features uh that that we hear about that are accessibility features are are sort of promoted as these kind of like, oh, check out these hidden features on iOS that will change the way. And it's like, no, these are not hidden features. They aren't, these aren't features that Apple has buried. There is a subset of the population that uses these features regularly and needs these features to be able to use their devices to the best of their ability. And that you, you know, I like that those features get promoted and that people get excited about them, but I I want this to be a situation where people uh, realize that, you know, it's not as if these are hidden away. And in fact, uh, from from everything that I have uh, heard from folks, and I'm curious to hear your take on things, and we'll, we'll get to that in a moment, is uh, that that Apple does seem to have a, a focus on accessibility that maybe some companies, um, some other tech companies and other other non tech companies maybe have not given enough uh, enough focus to. So, uh, with that. We, of course, uh, today are going to talk about awesome accessibility features and kind of get your take on the state of things. Uh, so let's kick things off with iOS 16. Of course, this is the next version of iOS. It'll be uh, paired with iPadOS 16, uh, macOS Ventura, and of course, the uh, various operating systems for the watch, for uh, HomePod, for the Apple TV, etc. Um, tell us about what folks can expect in iOS 16 and kind of what you are most excited about. I'm ready to hear your, your list of things. So kick it off. 
Sure. Well, iOS 16 looks like it's going to be a really good year for accessibility. Apple made a bunch of announcements about what was coming even before WWDC. So we in the accessibility community sort of had a little uh, bonus extra time to get ready. And that was fun. Uh, one of the most interesting features is one called door detection. And this is available on LiDAR capable phones and iPads. And it allows a person who's blind or visually impaired to basically use the phone's camera and the LiDAR sensor to determine whether a door is present, where it is, whether it's open, whether there are signage. And that's more useful than you might think, because like, let's say you're an independent traveler, you're blind or visually impaired, you get out of an Uber and you're at a shopping center or a restaurant or a home or whatever. That's great. The Uber drivers let you off. You say, I'm fine. Good. Thank you so much. But you got to find that door and you've got to figure out what the state of that door is, whether it's, again, whether it's open or closed, whether there's a sign that indicates that it's the right door. So door detection is this LIDAR uh, enabled feature that that's going to make that possible. And that's a follow on to a feature we got last year called people detection, which was great in the social distancing world, because it identified whether there was a person nearby and how far away that person was. So you could do a little bit of uh, social distancing ad hoc. And both these features, again, require LIDAR and they are made available in the magnifier app which is mm. an app that a person who's blind wouldn't necessarily open because it's for somebody who's low vision, who wants to make, who wants to zoom in and make what they're looking at bigger. But that's where they've, they've put it. And again, because it uses the camera. Uh, so for folks who have LiDAR equipped phones, a lot of people are really looking forward to door detection. It's even more practical than people detection. So that's, that's kind of the, the number one and kind of the coolest one from a technical innovation point of view, because something people don't realize in terms of accessibility is that a lot of times accessibility features can be innovation leaders or road signs, they can indicate what's coming. A lot of people have suggested that, uh, including me, I was suggested that uh, door detection and people detection because they use LIDAR are indicators of what might be coming later when Apple does uh, either AR equipped devices, headsets, or perhaps glasses down the road. Because uh, these features have uh, technological, uh, technological underpinnings that have much wider implications than just the accessibility part. Yeah, I, that's something that I have uh, noticed in the past is sometimes the features that may start in uh, the innovations that you talk about in accessibility end up bleeding into the rest of the system and uh, end up getting to become more than they were before. And, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of innovation taking place there, as you said. And I think that that points to um, certainly a a a good amount of resources being given to make sure that these things uh, work as they do. And for me, it's it's resulted in uh, me feeling comfortable when I've had questions from folks who have low or no vision or uh, other accessibility needs to be able to say, um, I suggest that you check out the iPhone or the iPad, depending on what they're asking for, because I know that voiceover uh, in particular and that some of the other features there are uh, well worth checking out and are helpful in, in those situations. And, you know, you can kind of count on those a little bit more than maybe uh, some of the third party offerings that you can add on to the system. So um, outside of those uh, those LiDAR based features, uh, what else uh, are you looking forward to in iOS 16? So there's another really interesting one called Apple Watch Mirroring. And basically, it will put the screen of an Apple Watch on your phone. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, if you have a physical disability, either because you can't manipulate gestures on your Apple Watch or because you can't get your hand around to do it, you know, you've got some sort of uh, motor delay. Uh, for some people, it's easier to do that on a phone screen. But beyond that, because the phone screen, ha the phone uh, itself has features like assistive touch and switch control and other features that make it possible for a person with a physical disability to use alternate gestures to manipulate the phone and often not to have to do as many taps or as many swipes if they can't do that. Essentially, you've taken that Apple Watch interface and you've put it on the phone and you've made it possible to apply those phone features that don't exist on the watch to the watch interface. And, and I guess some people might say, well, why have an Apple Watch if it's a challenge for you to use? Well, the Apple Watch offers a lot, including wheelchair workouts and including all the fitness features, including uh, access to apps in ways that people might be able to consume visually, even if they aren't able to manipulate them. So by putting the screen on the phone, which is super clever, uh, I, I feel like it's going to open up the Apple Watch to a lot of people with physical disabilities who kind of wondered whether they'd be able to use it or not. 
Absolutely. And I, I'm so I'm showing that feature on the screen right now. Um, one of the uh, other benefits here, uh, you know, whenever Rosemary and I are regularly talking about uh, different features, it's very handy to have uh, the Apple Watch right here on uh, the screen and be able to show that off where before we would have to have some sort of camera kind of above our heads and and shine down on it. So again, this is this is one of those times where you you say, you know, these these features on their own are fantastic uh, for what they provide. And it's one of those options where like instead of instead of focusing on that thing that you you mentioned that um, a person goes, why then have an Apple Watch instead of focusing on instead of having Instead of saying that is what I'm trying to say. Instead of saying, why uh, have an Apple Watch if you can't use it? Let's celebrate the fact that this technology is here and can be used by so many people. And also, um, as you point out, uh, with with somebody who has a, a motor delay, uh, think about uh, them trying to uh, get blood oxygen readings or uh, pulse rate readings or any number of things that the Apple Watch can do by being on your wrist regularly. So the health accessibility of the Apple Watch, I think, is important. Uh, so I, I think this feature is great and all the more reason uh, for folks to get Apple Watches and be able to uh, better monitor their health and and uh, keep track of the, that information. Yeah. Very cool stuff. All right. So another- uh, what's next? Yeah. Well, another interesting feature, and this is not so much about innovation. This is about adding something to a feature that a lot of people already love, uh, VoiceOver, which is the screen reader for an Apple uh, iOS device. And it's also this, the name of the screen reader on macOS. Uh, it, it basically allows your interface of your, your uh, device to be read aloud to you. And that's useful to people with blindness or visual impairment or even difficulty uh, with, with reading. And VoiceOver is the foundational accessibility feature of iOS and macOS. It's probably the most well-known. But what they've done this year is they've added a bunch of voices. And that's interesting. And languages, too. There are 20 new languages, which people are excited about. Uh, Ukrainian, Arabic, there are, there are a number of great languages. What's cool about the voices, and this one sort of came out a little beyond the Apple uh, Accessibility Awareness Day announcement, uh, but there's a set of voices called Eloquence that's from a company named Code Factory. They are available on a variety of screen readers in the Windows environment, uh, JAWS and uh, NVDA, which are sort of big players in that world. And people on the Apple side have always wanted those voices to come to Apple. And Apple has, doesn't have a history of going out and getting voices from other places. Now, you've always been able with third-party apps to add some voices to those apps specifically. But with the Eloquence voices now being integrated into iOS, uh, you can choose to use one of those many voices. And I always say, one of those voices is named Shelly. So clearly, it's a fine voice. <laughs> and you should try it. <laughs> uh, but, but the advantage awesome. that <laughs> Advantage that, yeah, I have my own. It's not the one I choose to use, which is kind of odd, but the advantage of Eloquence is it's optimized for reading at very high speed. If you're a screen reader user, uh-huh. and especially if you're reading a lot of content, if you're reading not just the interface, but documents, you know, for, for your work or for school or something like that, you tend to read at a much faster rate of speed and you get used to that high rate of speed. And Eloquence may not, in fact, be the most eloquent sounding voice. It may not be, you know, optimized for for, uh, for radio and for podcasts like you and I like to think we are, Micah. Uh, but <laughs> eloquence is very, very fast. And there are people who can read up to 85% of the maximum speed on eloquence. Where on Alex, they might read at 60 or 65%. No no knock on Alex. Alex still, is still a great voice for voiceover. Uh, but eloquence makes it possible for people to just be as efficient and productive as they possibly can. And it's also to be really... Frank, it's it's quite familiar for people who've lived in those other environments and they come to the Apple environment and they go, hey, where are the voices that I like? Well, Apple has said, here you go. Here's Eloquence. Interesting. Now, with Eloquence, are is this... A, is this created by some company? The, yes, the, it's co- the company called Code Factory licenses it to companies like uh, the like Freedom Scientific that makes Jaws, or uh, anybody who chooses to, to buy that license. So that's presumably what Apple has done. So when you get into Voiceover, you'll be able to download those voices just as you download Alex or any of the other voices. It, it's not it's there by default, but you have to download it in order to use it. So those are the first. Voices that I'm aware of that were generated outside of Apple to to come to VoiceOver. And they're not going to be available for Siri. They're going to be available explicitly in the accessibility uh, world for VoiceOver and Speak Screen and Speak Selection like that. But uh, it's it's kind of a big deal that Apple has listened to 
feedback from users and said, you know, these are voices that we really like. We like your voices, but we like some others better and we'd like to have that option. That's very cool. I, I think for um, it, it's a good idea to think about uh, f- for folks who are not low or no vision or who do not use voiceover. Think about how whenever you look at your phone and you read the word in your head and uh, there's actually some uh, laryngeal action that, that takes place uh, for, for people who are reading uh, unless they're specifically speed reading. And so as you are looking at your phone and looking at the different buttons, your brain is reading those words and so you know which ones you're supposed to hit. And for uh, folks with who need a, a an on-screen reader like voiceover, um, the the need to speed that up so that they can just as quickly as your brain looks at the word and says the word in your head so you know what you're tapping, uh, that is what those screen readers are aiming at doing. So that's really cool because I have heard um, someone using a using voiceover to uh, navigate their phone before, and I noticed that the speed was turned up. And I have uh, turned it on in the past and and realized, you know, kind of coming coming to my own conclusions without having talked to anybody, oh, right. I want to speed this up. And so then I started uh, speeding it up so that I could just kind of quickly uh, move through the phone uh, because it it moved as quickly as my brain would if I was looking at it and reading it. So I love, uh, thank you for that, that tidbit about eloquence coming to uh, iOS and, uh, uh, you know, where that comes from. That's really cool. Um, oh yeah. Uh, so that, that's a, a really important one. Um, I think we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back with lots more from Shelly Brisbane talking all about accessibility on iOS today. Uh, but I do want to tell you about Blue Land. We're bringing you this episode of iOS today. So here's a question for you. Did you know that an estimated 5 billion plastic hand soap and cleaning bottles are thrown away each year. And if that's not bad enough, most cleaning formulas are 90% water. That's heavy to ship and it leads to excessive carbon emissions. I mean, think about that. When really what you're after are the uh, different chemicals and compounds that are inside of the cleaning solution. And you know, that it's it's water that's mostly being shipped. It, it just, it's so much. It's excessive carbon emissions, and those products are often filled with nasty ingredients like chlorine and ammonia that you may not want to use inside of your home. That's a lose-lose situation because it's a lose, a loss for you, and it's a loss for the planet, which in turn is a loss for you. So it's kind of a lose-lose-lose. You ever feel overwhelmed by the number of plastic bottles and containers you throw away? Yeah, it can be kind of tough uh, as an individual trying to figure out how you can be of help to the to the planet and uh, to you know the the eco mindset overall. Ever thought about purchasing more eco friendly products, but you just didn't know where to start, or maybe you tried a few green products but found them pricey, or maybe they just didn't work very well. Well, if you answered yes to any of those questions, then you should meet Blue Land. See, Blue Land is on a mission to eliminate single use plastics by reinventing home essentials that are good for you and for the planet. They have innovative tablet refill solutions that take uh, up to 10 times less space than a traditional bottle, and the powerful formulas they offer keep your home clean and smelling amazing. Super simple idea. You grab one of the forever bottles, as they're called, and that is because you are meant to keep them forever. You fill it with warm water, you drop in the tablet, and you get cleaning. Refills start at just two bucks, and you don't have to buy new plastic bottles every time you run out. This is great, too. You can set up a subscription so you never run out of the products you use the most. And then by doing so, you save even more when you buy in bulk. There are cleaning sprays. There's hand soap. There's toilet cleaner. There's laundry tablets. All Blue Land products are made with ingredients you can feel good about. They sent me some uh, dishwasher tablets, uh, which are fantastic because you then get the replacement that goes in the tin that you get the first time. As well as I've got uh, three, count them, forever bottles, a multi-surface cleaner, a bathroom cleaner, and a window cleaner. And you drop it. It's kind of fun. It's a little bit of a uh, a chemistry demonstration. Uh, You drop in the tablet. You watch it kind of fizz in there. Give it a little shake. And you get these great scents. Um, Or there are some unscented products as well uh, for, for, I think, laundry and and stuff like that. Uh, So you can get what you need and oh i yeah the we were just showing on screen the um foaming soap uh bottle that woof that thing is really cool it is glass and so it is heavy 
so that if you set it down on a counter and you, you know, you're using it, it's not going to move all over the place, which can be kind of annoying. Uh, it sits there. It is a unit and uh, very easy to refill. So Here's my recommendation to you. Try the Clean Essentials Kit. It has everything you need to get started. Uh, Blue Land products come in refreshing signature scents like iris agave, fresh lemon, uh, and eucalyptus mint. Ah, oh, eucalyptus mint is one of my favorite scents in general. And also, for a limited time, you can try the hand soap with a summer upgrade. Those scents include strawberry rhubarb, citrus patchouli, and coconut palm. So you can get a little tropical with your scents there. Right now, you out there can get 15% off your first order when you go to blueland.com slash iOS. That's 15% off your first order of any Blueland products at blueland.com slash iOS. Again, blueland.com slash iOS. Go there, check out the great uh, Clean Essentials Kit. That must have been the one that they sent me in the mail because it had those uh, four bottles in it and uh, lots of great scents, uh, as well as, like I said, this dishwashing tablets, which are very handy. All right, we are back from the break. Thank you, Blue Land, and back to the show with Shelly Brisbane. Uh, tell us a little bit more about what we can expect in iOS 16 before we get into the state of Apple accessibility. Sure thing. Well, an another interesting feature, and this is for folks who are deaf or hard of hearing, this came out in iOS 15 and they've improved it in 16, and uh, it's called sound recognition. And when you enable it, if you're a deaf or hard of hearing person, you can't obviously be alerted by audio, but you can be alerted by light. And so with sound recognition, uh, you can cause your device to flash an LED when something happens. And they, what Apple did is they put in 15 common sounds like water running or a baby crying or a door slamming or doorbell ringing or a cat meowing or a dog barking. And those are great. That was part of iOS 15. But now they've added the ability to create a custom sound. And so the, the way I've, uh, some people have said this is exciting because let's say your rice cooker or your instant pot makes a particular sound that you would like to be alerted to when that sound goes off. So you record the sound, you put it in there, and then your device will alert you with an LED flash that says, hey, a sound has occurred that you might want to know about. And so then you can tell whether your rice cooker or your doorbell or your dog or what, whatever sound in your house uh, has gone off, which is, is super clever. It uses machine learning. And it's, it's just a, it's a great way to sort of customize your experience with how iOS can, uh, can help you identify sounds around your house. Nice. Yeah. That's, uh, I've, I've seen different folks, uh, show off that feature before and kind of tie it to some other options there. Uh, some exactly some, uh, shortcuts options and, and make sure that, uh, those oh, yeah. are all set up and, and, uh, alerted. Uh, any other ones that you want to talk about in iOS 16, maybe a quick hit on these last two here. Sure. Well, just briefly, there's a new one called Buddy Controller. Haven't used that one myself, but the idea is uh, other companies have produced uh, accessible game controllers, so again, for folks with motor delays. But a Buddy Controller actually allows you, if you're a person with a motor delay, to play a game in tandem with somebody else who doesn't have that motor delay. And the controllers work together as one. And so you basically can, can team tag team on a game playing experience, which is a super cool, super clever idea. I love this one. And I think about, too, uh, playing a game with uh, a younger person, um, you know, a, a sibling or a, a child uh, as well. And the idea that, you know, you can help them if they get frustrated in the game, uh, you can you can help them out with that. So, again, this is one of those features where, like, everybody benefits from the uh, inclusion of this. I love that. Yeah. Uh, and then the last one. So the last one is called Mac OS text checker. And uh, as the name implies, it's part of Mac OS, not iOS. iOS. So the problem is you can create do documents all you want as a blind or visually impaired person, accessible uh, text editors and uh, tools like pages and Word are, are very accessible. But you want to make sure that your formatting is correct. Are your bullets all lined up? Are your paragraphs lined up? Does it look nice so that when you turn your paper in at school or turn your presentation into your boss, does it look the way you want? And so what my what Mac OS Text Checker does, that's hard to say, uh, is with VoiceOver <laughs> enabled, it will give you guidance about whether your your bullets are lined up. You, you select some text and you say, you know, these, this text should all be bulleted, should be at the same level of indent, should look the same. Uh, so it's basically a little helper 
for formatting. And I, that's going to be so empowering to people who, you know, you, you've, again, you've got all the accessible ability technology you need at your job and uh, you're, you're, you're moving forward in your career, but you want to make sure that your presentations look as sharp or your documents look as sharp as anybody else's. So this is kind of a cool uh, little feature that a lot of people wouldn't think about, but uh, if you want to be productive in the workplace and uh, look cool while you're doing it, this is a great one. Wow. I hadn't heard about this one. So I'm glad that you, you shared that one. Is this, um, is this something that you toggle on and then it's a right click menu or do you know about how it's well, activated? It's, it's, first of all, you need to be in voiceover and I, be, I believe it's a right click type thing. Like in voiceover, you would use a keyboard command. You're typically not using mouse commands in voiceover, although you could, but that's, it's not practical. So, so it's, there's usually, there's a keyboard shortcut. I don't happen to know what it is, but Got you it. basically would put your document into text checker and say, Hey, is everything cool? And it would, it would tell Sweet. you and give you guidance where you need to fix things. That's awesome. All right. Well, those are some awesome new features that you can look forward to coming in iOS 16. Uh, before we get into the rest of the show, though, uh, Shelly's going to give us a rundown of the state. It is time for the state of the union as far as accessibility goes, <laughs> the state of Apple accessibility. <laughs> Right. It's not a long speech, though. Don't worry. You don't, and you don't have to clap. It's, it's not like a <laughs> stand or anything like that. But I just wanted to quickly talk about this because people always ask, well, hey, how is Apple doing when compared to other companies? And the, the short answer is Apple has been the leader in operating system-based accessibility for a very long time. I mentioned before VoiceOver was super innovative when it came out, and it continues to, to grow and change and evolve as operating systems do. And it's been brought to not only iOS, but to watchOS and tvOS. So it's continued to, to lead. Other companies have absolutely made progress. Microsoft particularly has done a lot of great things, both in terms of their operating system and in terms of projects in other parts of Microsoft that have used AI to do very cool accessibility uh, additions. Uh, and Google has as well. I, and I think the answer to the question that people most often ask me is, should I get an iPhone or an Android phone if I'm in the need of accessibility features? And the short answer is almost always, the iPhone, although I have friends with Android phones who are mad at me right now. Uh, the short answer <laughs> is accessibility in the iPhone is solid. It's reliable, especially if you're blind or visually impaired. It can be counted on, especially if you're a Braille user within that group. Uh, some of the innovations that they continue to make in terms of physical accessibility and in terms of hearing uh, are absolutely industry leading. But on the other hand, I would say it's not that Android is a bad platform. It's it's a fine platform, especially if you're not if, if you're if you're learning for the first time, because gestures in Android differ from from iPhone gestures. So if you switch from one or one to another, it might be challenging. If you're a Braille user and really depend on Braille in your life, Android is probably not the best choice for you. So all the platforms out there now are good and accessible, and there are challenges with apps and there are challenges with individual kinds of accessibility on sort of a small board level. But generally speaking, the, the iPhone, the iOS platform in general is, is a solid platform from an accessibility point of view. And, and I think it continues to be. Uh, the, the only sort of challenges that really have come, I think, are in, in, in Mac OS. I don't think Apple has kept up quite as well as they could have, especially in voiceover. Uh, voice control, which is a relatively new accessibility feature that, again, helps folks with motor delays use voice commands instead of having to use mice or keyboards, uh, is, is a cool new innovation that is both on iOS and Mac OS, and Apple should absolutely be given great credit for that. But if you like voiceover, on the Mac OS platform continues to, to lag behind other screen readers. And that's why there are a lot of people who are blind or visually impaired who have stuck to Windows because they know JAWS, they know NVDA, those big screen readers. And they're like, hey, I don't know whether I can rely on voiceover. And and so, so there's still some challenges there. And I should lastly point out, and this is not a ding at Apple, this is something for developers to think about. There's still really interesting, great apps on Mac OS that have not been made voiceover accessible. There are oh. iOS apps that aren't voiceover accessible, but I think it's worse on the Mac. I think that there are surprising ones. On iOS, you can kind of you can kind of tell, and I think iOS developers, because the, their apps are newer and they're sort of relying more on the, the default accessibility that Apple provides to them, often lean toward accessibility more so than do macOS apps that sometimes have older code bases. And so I would challenge macOS developers to, despite what I said about some people being more trustful of Windows screen readers, I would challenge those developers to get out there and make their apps more accessible to voiceover because there are people who want to use the Mac and people who have, having used the iPhone and the iPad, 
would like to know whether the Mac is a viable platform for them. And sometimes I have to say, it depends on what app you're using. So uh, more accessibility from the developer side would really help a lot. All right. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's super important that developers be mindful of that. And I think sometimes that is missed. And um, it's one of those things where you just want to say, hey, pay attention to this. This is this is incredibly right. important. Right. And especially because, you know, it, when you think if you I, I want to think about it from the perspective of just like it's the right thing to do. But you can also if you need to think of it this way, it's like, how many people are you not getting to use your app if you don't make it accessible? There's so many people out there who right. need those uh, accessibility uh, features. And so we should we should be considering that whenever we're uh, creating apps. Um, all right. Well, uh, that brings us to the end of the accessibility portion of the show. Uh, well, specifically anyway. Uh, of course, folks can uh, check out your book, iOS Access for All at iosaccessbook.com and uh, go to Parallel to check out Parallel at relay.fm slash Parallel. Um, but uh, we'll we'll get some more plugs from you at the end. But I did want to mention those two right there at the top of the show. And now it's time to head into the news segment. All right. Up first in the news segment, uh, there was an interesting piece. Uh, we continue to see the AirTag being used. This is uh, Apple's device for tracking down lost items. Uh, it uses an ultra-wideband chip. And now... Uh, according to the Okaloosa County Sheriff's Office in Florida, um, last week, AirTag data was used as part of a search to find an airline worker who had stolen thousands of dollars worth of checked luggage. Um, according to the Okaloosa County Sheriff's Office, uh, a suitcase with more than $1,600 didn't make it to the final destination. And uh, apparently there was a uh, traveler who had uh, not received their uh, checked bag that had more than $15,000 worth of jewelry in it. Um, find, the Find My app was used to be able to track down the lost luggage. And uh, I'll quote from the 9 to 5 Mac article, once officers made contact with DeLuca, the person who was uh, uh, charged with this or was... Um, you know, accused of this. He admitted to removing the AirTag from the first victim's suitcase. He didn't do this quickly enough, however, since the AirTag still helped investigators track him down. He has been charged with two counts of grand theft. Um, so yes, <laughs> be mindful. Lots of people are putting uh, AirTags on their luggage and uh, other items, and AirTags are being used regularly. We've seen, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, different stories about people using the AirTag to track down lost luggage. I'm curious, Shelly, do you have any AirTags? Have you thought about getting AirTags for your stuff? I have one, and I, I put it in my bag when I travel. Uh, and uh, I, yeah, I, I've not found it necessary for things around my house, but for luggage is the number one. And I'll tell you, just as an accessibility thing, uh, it doesn't really work as well as you might like, but I have trouble spotting my specific bag on the luggage carousel. So the theory is if I put an air pack in that thing, uh, then it'll call to me when I get to the luggage carousel. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't always work as well because you can't necessarily hear it from that remote distance. But uh, and, and there's a lot of other bags around, but uh, that was always my big use case for an air, pack, air tag and why I got one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have uh, a few and um, I actually, so I used them for a while. And at some point when there's more time in a show, I'll have to go into the whole thing about why mine aren't working anymore. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's a very, very long story included it like that involves so many calls to Apple and lots of support uh, people and high up engineers trying to figure out what went wrong and all sorts of stuff. So there's not time for that. But uh, yeah, when I did, when I was able to use them back in the day, when I first got them, um, I had a couple of times where uh, I used them to find a specific item. Uh, it was an item that I didn't regularly use. And so it got buried under something somewhere. And uh, I was able to use it to find that because I haven't done a lot, whole lot of travel. But, um, you know, in theory, uh, when that does right. happen again, I think I'll be using them for that. Uh, the next one that I wanted to talk about, it's incredibly important. We are using Zoom uh, to do this call. And so this is a warning to you, Shelly, as much as it is to anyone else out there. If you use Zoom and you use a Mac, 
you need to update to the latest version of Zoom. Uh, you can do that by clicking on zoom.us in the menu bar at the top of the Mac and choosing check for updates and then find the latest update. That is because there's been a really big vulnerability somehow in the Zoom installer for Mac uh, that gives a uh, gives the potential for a bad actor to gain root access to the Mac. And that, folks, uh, is not a good thing. Root access basically means they have all the control uh, that they want over this. So if you have not updated Zoom to the latest version, please update as quickly as you possibly can. It is very important. <sighs> Sent that around to my work colleagues yesterday. I made them all do it. They're good. Like, it's, yeah. <laughs> they do what I tell them mostly. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Um, one more here from the news segment, and that is uh, a report from Bloomberg, uh, Mark Gurman at Bloomberg, writing in Mark Gurman's newsletter, uh, where he uh, suggests that Apple is planning on uh adding more ads to the iPhone. So as it stands, there are ads. I didn't know this, but there are, because I always delete this app. Um, the stock app has had ads in it for quite some time. Um, I knew that the news app had stocks, but I had no idea that the stocks app had uh, ads because I just, I don't use it, never have used it. And so I always delete it uh, from all of my devices. And so these ads are uh, potentially new ones will be added to uh, the, it could be added to Apple TV plus content uh, as well as, let's see where else. Um, we know that the app store has search ads and things like that, but we could see them come to uh, more areas of the app store. And uh, in that way, then we would see kind of content there. And it's unclear uh, for sure where else we would see it, but apparently... Uh, Apple has gained more, uh, or a team within Apple that works on advertising has gained more of a footing inside of the company per this Bloomberg report and uh, could be adding more ads. I'm curious, uh, Shelley, your take on Apple in on one uh, hand, adding that app tracking transparency technology that keeps, uh, that gives individuals the choice to not be tracked across different apps and how that has played into a uh, kind of downturn in some ways for businesses in in the advertising business. So on one hand, making it harder for other advertisers to be able to sell ads, uh, while also potentially considering adding more ads to the system. What is What's your take on that? Yeah, I think the, the criticism of ATT has always been from other companies, hey, you're taking away our revenue. And as a consumer and as a somebody who doesn't really want to watch ads, I haven't been able to feel particularly uh, sorry for them. But they've also said, hey, Apple wants to basically create a walled garden where they can be the only ones distributing ads. And this is absolutely clear that that's what's happening now. And I think for, for a lot of people and maybe even a little beyond the tech bubble, I think people are going to start to feel a little bit less, you know, excited about Apple because that they're doing exactly what other companies are doing. That's just that they have the protection of their own platform under which to do it. And uh, obviously Apple continues to need to change and grow its revenue path. I don't know how much money they anticipate uh, making from these ads over time, but I think it's unfortunate. I, I wish they didn't feel like they had to do it. I agree. That's precisely how I feel about the situation. All right. With that, we come to the end of the news segment, which means it's time for feedback and questions. Uh, our first question comes in from MJ. MJ writes, Hi, Mike and Rosemary, or in this case, Shelly. I watch your podcasts weekly and have learned a lot from both of you. Thank you. I listen to the Tech Guy regularly and other twit.tv shows as time allows. I am 71 and I'm starting to make my end of life plans now. Better late than never. After reading about what one should do to prepare, online data, including passwords and social media, are discussed often. All that's to say, it made me want to clean up my systems and how I do things. So I started with passwords. For years, I used LastPass exclusively, always paid for 
for it, so that is not an issue for me. When I switched to Apple products from Android a while back, I started using Keychain more, and I didn't always keep LastPass in sync with Keychain. Now, I think I might want to go back to LastPass. One reason I'm a little concerned is I recently saw a YouTube that said Keychain isn't a good choice because it doesn't have a separate login for the Keychain application, which made some sense to me. However, I don't want to overreact to one person's YouTube. Another reason is in LastPass, it seems like I can include so much more information in the secure notes section. If I switch over from Keychain, unless there is a security reason not to, I want to use LastPass so I don't need to learn another password management application. I am not opposed to using both Keychain and LastPass. Security is the deciding factor, really. Maybe I should use Keychain for passwords and just use LP for security notes. Your thoughts? And then uh, MJ goes on to ask, is it safe to print passwords from Keychain and or LastPass? Is the data encrypted end to end? When adding an extension for LastPass and Safari, I received the attached message, so I stopped. And I will talk about what that message said. Not sure what it means. Who can read all the contents? I was able to add the extension in Chrome, so maybe that's enough. All right. So let's start at the top with MJ's uh, first question. So uh, MJ mentions that uh, they didn't always keep Keychain and LastPass in sync. And that was because MJ was concerned given that a YouTube uh, video said that Keychain isn't a good choice because it doesn't have a separate login for the Keychain application. So <clears throat> we'll start there. Uh, this is something that uh, has... I understand the concern here. Basically, it's saying that, you know, when you log into your Apple account, then that password on its own is the same password that's being used for your keychain. On the Mac, it's a little bit different because it uses the uh, password that you use for your Mac. Um, so, you know, whenever you launch that, you have to type in the password for your Mac or authenticate with your finger if you have uh, that available. So... On the face of it, I can understand the concern there, uh, given that if you use LastPass, it's a wholly separate password. And so that can be kind of, uh, you know, an extra layer of protection. But I think in the scheme of things, uh, in the grand scheme of things, due to the fact that either option is uh, encrypted and you have to log into your account and often have to re-authenticate in order to use that. If you aren't in a situation where you are sitting at a desk uh, in a public place and you walk away without locking your computer, then I don't think that it's too much of a concern that uh, Keychain and LastPass use diff or that, that you have a you have one less login with Keychain versus LastPass. Um, and I love MJ that you said hey, I don't want to just overreact based on the fact that one YouTube said that. Um, very good thinking, uh, very wise there. But yes, I, I think that um, overall, it's not a huge concern, but I think that having a separate password for your uh, password management application can be nice just to have that extra layer of security. Um, the other thing is that... Uh, you note that in LastPass, it seems like you, you can include much more information in the secure notes section. Um, that's likely so. I will say that uh, they have added the ability to add information to secure notes in uh, Keychain. And I think that's going to continue to improve as they try to make Keychain more of an overall fa uh, password manager and not just a place to store uh, passwords that are randomly generated. So that's something to keep in mind. But this goes all the way down to the most important thing that you've said. With security as the deciding factor, you want to know if you should use Keychain for passwords and just use LastPass for security notes, or if you should use one or the other. The most important thing to know is that you should not have your passwords in two different places if you want to be the most secure that you possibly can be. What I mean there is... If you have your passwords in LastPass and you have your passwords in uh, the one password password manager and you have your passwords in Keychain, those are three different places now that a person can try to get your passwords from versus just the one place alone where all of that is stored, all of that information is there. And so having those in all separate places is not necessarily a good idea. So it depends on convenience. You say that security is your most important concern as opposed to convenience. And so I think that you should limit yourself to one place. And that will also mean that the, you don't have to keep doing that syncing there. Um, 
As far as printing out passwords from Keychain and or LastPass, uh, it's important to note that when you export passwords from Keychain as an XML document, um, those passwords are stored non-securely. They You literally can open up the XML document and see all of your logins and passwords. So you want to print that out as quickly as possible and delete the file as quickly as possible so that it's not stored in a digital place unencrypted uh, or available. And, you know, wherever you're trying to put that physical document that lets you uh, tuck it away. But I would also suggest maybe instead of printing out all of your passwords, you have that legacy option set up where you just have the one password that the person who's you know coming across these documents can go to, type that in, and then get access to all of your passwords. So if that's iCloud, then that where your keychain uh, is stored, then they can do that there. Or if it's LastPass and it's that one password that you use for that, um, then you can do that as well. Last but not least, you ask, when adding the extension for LastPass and Safari, I received the attached message. The message that MJ had received was the one that says, um, this, this extension wants to have access to uh, all of your sites. And you have the option to allow it to access all sites or access just the site that you're on, or you can deny it. Um, and you said you installed it on Chrome and that was easy, you know, that that was enough. So MJ, when you install it on Chrome, you're actually giving it that same permission to access and view all of the different sites that you visit. But Google feels like that is not something that needs to be um, said to the user because by installing the extension, you are in that moment that you choose to install the extension, uh, opting in to let that extension view all the different sites that you visit. And so they only give you the option to allow or disallow an extension in incognito mode. And so Safari goes and Apple go a little bit further in giving the, the user the ability to choose even in non-incognito uh, or private browsing, the ability to say, I do or I don't want. So I will tell you this, MJ, I cannot give you a, uh, I, do, I do not want to give you a recommendation over what you should do in terms of whether you should allow all or allow none or allow one. But my password manager extension, I chose allow access to all websites because I trust my password manager to do the one thing that it's supposed to do and not view my browsing data and collect it and store it. I know that the password manager that I use is solely meant to do that. And so I give it access to all of my sites uh, with no problem. It's just that Apple is giving you a little bit more information. If you've installed it on Chrome, then you've already given that password manager uh, access to view all of the different sites, except if you're in an incognito mode, in which case you would have to toggle that on. So lots to cover there in that MJ uh, question, but I wanted to make sure to get all of that information in and provide as much uh, as I could um, when, whenever it comes to that. But it's very good that you are uh, considering the 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 consideration you were considering the considerations that you are considering uh, what folks would want to do uh, after you have passed and that that information is available. I, as um, a relatively young person, also have legacy stuff set up uh, so that people can access mine because it's not just age that kills people. Um, and it's every reason to make sure that you've got all that stuff set up uh, should you shuffle off this mortal coil. All right. Whew, that was a lot there, Shelley. Uh, this next one comes from Michael, who writes in, Lately on Apple TV+, Plus, I've gotten more than HBO Max notifications for the latest episode of the shows I am watching being available. I also now get baseball alerts. I truly don't care about watching baseball on TV versus at a ballpark. I wish I could turn these off and only get the ones I want. And then Michael writes, I know Rosemary has some great automation scripts and thought this might be uh, one she knows how to handle with maybe a text gener text recognition of the word baseball that would suppress it. Well, Michael, you don't need to even go that far. Um, it is actually a very easy thing to do. Uh, if you launch the settings app and you scroll down to TV and then you scroll all the way down to where it says, uh, well, now I've lost, oh, notifications. 
And then you scroll all the way down to the bottom again, there's an option that says customize notifications and you can toggle off featured sports. That should stop the uh, sports ball from popping up as part of the notifications from your Apple TV there. I get notifications on my iPhone uh, pretty regularly uh, about you know the shows that I watch. Do you use any of those notifications, Shelley? No, I don't. In fact, I don't want to be notified because I <laughs> I don't watch that much TV and the notifications are just irritating to me. So yeah, I would probably turn that off if I were a regular. If I had any notifications on at all, I would probably turn off the featured sports as well. <laughs> nice. Yeah, um, I've thought about turning them off uh, entirely. Uh, but what ends up happening is then uh, my partner will let me know, hey, the latest episode of that show is out. I that one. <laughs> and so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to turn this on so that we both are aware of this and that we that I don't have yeah, to. But, he, that you but don't he's have providing to you notifications, partner That's notifications. True. That's a feature. Yeah, who right? needs? This is a good point. This, you know what? I'm toggle, you've, you've convinced me. I'm toggling you off you toggle my on. Apple TV notifications. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last one comes from Nani. And this one is a really interesting Interesting one that had me kind of uh, scratching my head a little bit looking around. Uh, Noni writes, I listen to iOS daily. Hopefully not, because we don't do the show every day. I don't know what I would do if I had to do the show every day. I imagine <laughs> that, that they mean weekly. <laughs> that kind of gave me a little panic there. Like, oh my goodness, who else is doing iOS today? Anyway, and also the Tech Guy show. I think you will have the best recommendation. That's very kind. Uh, Noni writes, my mom lives in NJ, I think New Jersey, uh, and I'm in CA, that's California. I FaceTime with her, and when I want to screen share, she has trouble adding the password and accepting the screen share on FaceTime. So my idea is to give her an iPad that I can control from California. The apps that I found require the two devices to be on the same Wi-Fi network. What do you recommend? Well, I've got bad news. The bad news is there's not an inexpensive solution. Uh, the way that you kind of circumvent the the cost is by being on that same Wi-Fi network, which of course is not doable uh, when you're in two different states, or at least not doable very easily. Um, and so what you would want to look into, I assume that whenever you're talking about this, you're, these are for security or uh, for, for troubleshooting stuff and trying to help uh, the person get things set up. Uh, there are two services that I would recommend. Uh, there's Splash Top SOS and there is Zoho Assist. And these two apps are specifically created or two services are specifically created to give... Uh, a remote user the ability to control an iOS or iPadOS device from a distance. And as someone has pointed out, TeamViewer is also an option. When I looked into TeamViewer, it was so expensive that I didn't include it on the list. Uh, TeamViewer is pricey. And so Splashtop SOS and Zoho Assist were a little bit less expensive uh, and still had good ratings and things like that. So I felt more comfortable about suggesting that one. Um, essentially what happens is you on your side will either install a Mac app or an iOS or iPadOS app, and the person on the other side will do the same. And then there will be a code that you need to type in to get things set up. And so what I actually would recommend is you get this set up for your mom uh, whenever you two are together in person the first time. And then after that, it can be easy to do. Um, but I don't, if, if you're not in person regularly, then what you are doing right now with the screen sharing is going to be just as um, feature rich as using one of these feature one of these uh, services. So unfortunately, there's not a super great answer on this one um, because it's not a use case. I think that uh, Apple uh, has front of mind outside of you know businesses. And so you kind of have to do the most uh, to to make it work. As Doug in the chat points out, um, it's weird that Apple Remote Desktop doesn't do iOS, only Mac OS. Mm -hmm. I agree. Now, some uh, somebody's saying that TeamViewer is free for non-commercial use, but I don't know if the... Because the ability to control mobile devices is an add-on feature that you have to buy. And so I don't know if it, as an add-on feature, is available as part of the free non-commercial use version of TeamViewer. Um, I can look more into that uh, to, to be certain. But um, when I was doing that research, uh, the it was like $547 or something. Um, do you have any other suggestions or thoughts? Have you ever had to uh, either have someone remote in to help you or you remote in to help somebody else, Shelly? 
I've done that research for my mom. In fact, she has an iPad and uh, she, she is older. She has macular degeneration. And so she has trouble seeing the iPad. And so I've tried to help her remotely on multiple occasions. And I came to the conclusions that you did that you're going to have to pay and it's going to be expensive. And when I did the research a year ago on TeamViewer, it was the same thing. It, was, it wasn't part of the free service, but that could have changed. I'm not saying it's current, but we ended up opting not to do it because mom just decided she didn't want to pay for the service. And so it was kind of, well, how, how do you, how, how, be, how well do you want your tech support to work mom? And she kind of decided that she'd rather call me up or have me come over. Fortunately, we live in the same city. So, uh, you know, every, every week or so I got to go over and do a little tech support for mom. <laughs> nice. All right. Um, with that, we are ready to move on to the app caps. Oh boy. Is it time? It is time. This is the part of the show where we wear head coverings atop our heads to honor our app caps. These are the apps or gadgets that we are using that we want to share with all of you because we think they are great and that you would want to check them out yourselves. And so uh, while I continue to try and struggle to put my cap atop my head, <laughs> um, Shelly, tell us about the cap that you have, which is fabulous. And then tell us about your pick. First of all, I have to say that I forgot when we were going to do this that I was going to have headphones on, and I'm so glad that it fit into the <laughs> headphones. Yay! Uh, this is this is an armadillo. Uh, I come from Austin, Texas. Our, our armadillo is sort of a mascot around Austin, specifically Texas in general. But um, I bought this years ago at a place called Whole Earth Provision Center Company. Notice it has a tail, which is the best Aww, part. Oh, um, it's so cute. And it's, it's furry, it's adorable, and it's not even too warm, despite the fact that it's, you know, 100 degrees outside today. Uh, but... Yeah, I was so excited that I got a chance to wear my armadillo cap for you. Amazing, uh, amazing. <laughs> so so my pick, is, and this is an oldie but a goodie. I asked Micah if he wanted something new or something that was a favorite. And since he said I could use a, do a favorite, I decided to do it. It's an app that uh, has been recognized. It's won awards, Apple Design Awards in, included. Uh, it's called Voice Dream Reader. But it's an app I use on a daily basis because what it does is it takes – text or PDFs or EPUBs or basically any sort of file with text in it pretty much, and it will turn it into audio. You can actually bring audio files into Voice Dream Reader and have it read those aloud to you as well. So why is that useful? Well, from an accessibility point of view, if I'm reading a long article, sometimes it's easier for me to consume it as an audio uh, file, like an audio book, or I, I've, I've brought whole books into Voice Dream Reader, and it will do them. It manages EPUBs well in the sense that it will recognize chapter markers. You can put bookmarks in, and it has a number of voices. You can use the built-in voices that come uh, with iOS, or you can buy additional voices. The app itself costs $24.99 plus you can buy additional voices if you have particular favorites. And I have a couple of favorites that are really high quality voices. You have control of the speed, you have control of the pitch, really terrific app. And one thing that does make it new is that uh, recently the developer, Winston Chen, who's, who has a great suite of voice stream products, uh, created an, a, a Mac OS version of this, which means that I often am reading on the Mac and I want to save an article for later. So I could use some, what I used to do was I would uh, use something like Pocket or Instapaper back in the day and I would send it to one of those apps and then it would automatically send it to voice stream because voice stream allows me to configure it to do that. But now that there's a Mac OS version, I can uh, open up Safari and in the sharing extension, Voice Stream is there, and I can send it directly to Voice Stream Reader. And I don't even have to use the, the pocket thing to inter, to, as an intervention. Uh, if I'm using some other browser, obviously I do have to do that because there's not a share extension. But it's just so seamless, and it syncs over iCloud. It is not an inexpensive app. So if it's something that you would use casually, you know, maybe not for you. But for me, it's something I use every day. I use it in my work. I use it in my you know, for fun. But in the morning, uh, one of the first things I do for, for my job as a radio producer is I, I read the news and I find things that I might want to turn into stories for our show. And so I will often send those to Voice Dream Reader and I'll spend half an hour or so uh, reading, uh, you know, just, just you know, getting caught up on the news and finding stories. And I will say that for voiceover users, a great thing about this is that uh, voiceover takes over your iOS device. Uh, you can't do anything else while voiceover is on and while it's reading to you. But with Voice Stream Reader, I can have it reading in the background. Again, it's like an audiobook or it's like a podcast. It just reads to me while I do other things. And it's great. And I love it. That is awesome. I'm going to have to get this one for sure. Um, there are often times where I want to, I mean, that's why I listen to so many audiobooks is because 
I want to complete other tasks, but also still get what I want to get, uh, you know, audioly, I guess, uh, auditorially. And so that would be a great option there. I, you know, doing different things with my hands and being able to uh, read some articles or what have you. So I will definitely be checking that out. Voice Dream Reader. Um, I am continuing to wear Paisley bandanas atop my head as part of my app caps. Um, th- today fetching. it's a... Thank you. Thank you. It's a dark maroon uh, color for my bandana today. And uh, my app is one called Stoic. And Stoic is a self-care app that I have actually um, found more useful than I typically find these apps. A lot of times it's the same old thing over and over again, and they don't end up being kind of what I would expect out of a uh, a, a self-care app, or they just seem to be kind of, uh, they don't have as much of, of, of the helpful information that I'm after. And Stoic actually does seem to have that. It is an app that has uh, first, it'll start you off by asking you some questions to kind of get what get some knowledge about what you would want to do uh, in the app and you know what you're after. And then from there, it can start to recommend some uh, options for you on what uh, specifically uh, you you are looking to kind of target. And so you set up different times of day where you're checking in and seeing kind of uh, how you're feeling. And there uh, there's a, a journal that you can do, but there are also exercises, including breathing exercises, meditation exercises, Um when you journal, you can set different goals. So there's a time goal, a word goal. Uh, there's also a special focus mode that kind of removes everything out from the environment so that you're just working on that. Um, so this is also great for folks who are like trying to get writing done. Um, there's also guided journaling. So I love that it's got some prompts in there to help you kind of figure things out. And then what's cool too is that it helps you kind of create uh, to... to to be able to use it on any device. That's super important to me is that I can use Stoic. I can pop it open on my Mac if I'm there and uh, kind of get some information about that. And then there are all these little tidbits too. Um, for example, decision fatigue. And so the, the prompt says, have you ever heard of decision fatigue? If you have, can you describe it? If not, can you imagine what it means before searching for its definition online? So then you can kind of get an idea of what that means and learn more about it. Uh, and I love that it prompts you to kind of learn more about it and, and see that information. Uh, like I said, all sorts of different um, exercises that are built in and they tie into Apple's health app. So you can actually kind of keep track of your mindfulness minutes and that. Uh, And it is available to download for free. There are premium options available as well. Uh, $6.99 a month, $37.99 a year. So about 38 bucks a year. Or if you really like the app and you don't like in-app purchases or subscriptions, you can outright pay for it for $95 dollars one time and it's yours for the entirety of the app's existence um you'll get trends and stuff over time as well and what i like about this uh is that their privacy policy is really nice uh, that's important to me so one that when i'm looking for these kinds of apps i want to make sure that they are being respectful of my privacy and if they're free then they typically uh have something that's not great and so this one not being free actually you know you you pay for it uh looking into then the privacy policy was like okay uh, i feel pretty good about this one so that is stoic available for uh free to download with uh, those in-app purchases if you are after kind of a an app that has you check in with yourself during the day and also learn some different meditation techniques and breathing exercises. Folks, that actually brings us to the end of this episode of iOS Today. Uh, if you have questions, thoughts, feedback, concerns, etc., you can send those to iostoday at twit.tv. Of course, you can tune in live to watch the show as we record it every Tuesday at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern by going to twit.tv slash live. But as always, we think the best way to get the show is by subscribing or following uh, by going to twit.tv slash iOS. When you do so, you can click to subscribe to audio or subscribe to video and those buttons will give you some options for how to subscribe to the show across different services, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, etc. Try to be in all those places. Twit.tv slash iOS. That's the place that you go to check that out. I also want to mention Club Twit. That is our 
completely ad-free experience. And uh, the club just keeps getting better, folks. For seven bucks a month, twit.tv slash club twit, here's what you get. You get access to every single Twitch show with no ads. So that includes iOS Today, an ad-free experience here. You get access to the Twit Plus bonus feed that has extra content you won't find anywhere else. That's behind the scenes, before the show, after the show, everything in between. And some great stuff that uh, takes place in the Club Twit Discord every month. What is the Club Twit Discord? Well, it's a place where you can go to chat with your fellow Club Twit members and also those of us here at Twit. Uh, my co-host, Rosemary Orchard, is actually one of the most active people in the Club Twit Discord. Uh, and then, last but not least... My show, Hands on Mac, is a Club Twit exclusive. Super awesome uh, to, to know that people are out there subscribing uh, to Club Twit to get that show with all sorts of tips and tricks for your Mac and your iOS devices. It's all of your Apple devices. Uh, my last show that I did was all about spam calls and spam texts and how to filter those annoying things out. Uh, so check that out. Twit.tv slash Club Twit. Shelly Brisbane. As I promised, now is your chance to plug. Uh, where can folks find you online? What website site should they go to? Uh, all that jazz. Well, Micah, thanks so much for having me. First of all, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, well, so my main website is brisbane.net, B-R-I-S-B-I-N.net. And that's where uh, where it all starts, where all my stuff is collected. But for this purpose, uh, folks might be interested in my book, iOS Access for All, which is a comprehensive guide to accessibility for the iOS and iPadOS platform. The 10th anniversary edition of that book will come out sometime after iOS 16 is released this fall. So watch for that. You can find that at iOSaccessbook.com. If you want the iOS 15 version, that's available for you now in multiple formats. Also uh, on a little bit of a summer hiatus right now, but the Relay podcast uh, that I do, Parallel, will be coming back in September. And uh, that is a, my podcast about technology with really interesting guests who talk about accessibility-related topics as they uh, connect to, te to tech. And, and finally, uh, find me on Twitter, which is my sort of main social media place. And I'm just Shelly, S-H-E-L-L-Y, over there. Awesome. Shelly, thank you so much for your time today. We will definitely be having you back on in the future. Uh, lots of folks in the chat saying that they were so happy to uh, have you here today oh. and thought that you were awesome. And uh, so thank, thank you, you for your time. And thank you, those of you out there listening to the show. Rosemary Orchard will be back next week. Uh, but... Until then, I hope that you learned all sorts of cool accessibility things thanks to Shelly Brisbane. Uh, we will see you next time on iOS Today. Goodbye. The world is changing rapidly. So rapidly, in fact, that it's hard to keep up. That's why Micah Sargent and I, Jason Howell, talk with the people making and breaking the tech news on Tech News Weekly every Thursday. They know these stories better than anyone. So why not get them to talk about it in their own words? Subscribe to Tech News Weekly and you won't miss a beat every Thursday at twit.tv.